Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's edition of the Triangle Area SQL Server Users Groups Data Science SIG. So tonight we have speaking for us Brad Llewellyn, who is going to tell us about PySpark. And there will be some interesting plot mechanics behind tonight's session, so stay tuned for those. First, we have two quick announcements before we get to Brad's talk. The first one is that Data Architecture Day is coming up on Saturday, May 16th. It'll be an all-day Twitch marathon, which basically is it goes until I get too tired or I run out of sessions, you know, whichever, whichever comes first. We still have one more day for the call for speakers. If you do want to sign up for that, the link is at meetup.com slash tripass. There's a Data Architecture Day meetup that you can you know, meet up for. But there is also a link to Sessionize where you could drop in your call for papers uh, submission. And we're going to take probably as many as we can. Basically, again, the, the joke the joke is real until I fall asleep. Uh, that's, that's how I define a marathon. So we're going to take as many sessions as we can, drop them in in a row. That'll be Saturday, May 16th. A little bit, well, a lot of a downer. So uh, many of you know Greg Pugh. Greg is the founder of the TriangleArea.net user group, so Trinug. And Greg's been a friend of mine for years. Uh, he's been a great guy for the community. Unfortunately, he passed away just recently. So I wanted to express my deepest condolences for Greg and to his family. Um, I, he was a great guy. Um, I'm going to miss him tremendously. So I want to just drop in a quick moment of silence. Okay, thank you. Um, the tr uh, Trinug meeting tomorrow, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, Greg. So if you wanna share your thoughts, express uh, your your stories about him, go check that out, meetup.com slash Trinug, T-R-I-N-U-G. And I'm sure that um, they'll love it, they'll love it. So now we're gonna switch gears entirely and Talk about PySpark. So we have with us Mr. Brad. Take it away. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, as as Kevin said, my name is Brad Llewellyn. I uh, I live in Charlotte, so I'm I'm a few hours away from you guys. Interestingly, uh, when Kevin and I were chatting a while back about me presenting to the group, I was like, "Hey, can we do it virtual?" And now that seems to be uh, the only option. So. Quite a coincidence there, but it works out because we all get to hang out together. So as, as Kevin said, today we're going to talk about PySpark. This, th this was a really interesting presentation for me to put together because Python is absolutely the future at this point. Uh, it's, it's, it's become very apparent that for data engineering, for data science, for data preparation, heck, even automation and, and administration, Python's becoming the one and only language. So I have uh, a good bit of material here, and and you'll be able to get it off my GitHub, which I'll give you a link to uh, if you if you want the actual materials. Uh, but we have too much material here to cover in an hour. So Kevin posted a straw poll in the chat, if you wouldn't mind going to that and selecting which of the three topics you'd like to see us focus on tonight. So we have a section dedicated to kind of Spark internal data engineering. We've got a section devoted to more SQL-like data preparation, as well as a section devoted to building predictive models. So I'll give you maybe 30 seconds to hop over there and, and fill that out. And we will also take full advantage of the fact that there is a uh, producer's delay in this. So we have, we've got about 15 to 20 second um, delay which Brad is actually going to be able to see because he's also watching himself as he presents, which is kind of Spaceballs like. Only we can rewind the broadcast.
Okay, so it looks like we've got uh, some votes for the data prep and the predictive modeling side, which is great because they go hand in hand. Uh, we can we can gloss over the data engineering at the beginning too, just to give you a little bit of a taste of that. But before we get to that, um, one, love this to be as interactive as possible. Understand the format is, is not optimal and I'd love to be there in, in person with you. Uh, but please feel free to chime in at any time in the chat. Um, Kevin's more than happy to stop me and, and bring up any questions you might have. And like I said, uh, every, everything you're going to see tonight's available on my GitHubs. You can always go back and check it out later as well as check the, the VODs and the YouTube for the group. Uh, one call out here, I do work for Microsoft. Um, and in fact, I work for a team in Microsoft that offers uh, advice to customers. Um, that is not what's happening tonight. So uh, please, please don't don't go back to work tomorrow and say that uh, Microsoft told you to do this and that. Uh, not not happening tonight. But this is Brad um, here here to talk to you. So happy to talk to you as, as that. And, and, and if you want to talk more about kind of the Microsoft side of things, we can have a, a separate conversation. So a little bit about me. Um, there's my there's my son in the picture. I've actually got two kids now. That picture is a, a little old, but uh, I I am, am a data analytics architect uh, for for a team called Fast Track for Azure. So what I do day in and day out is to help customers understand kind of what the different options are available in Azure for doing their many different data needs, whether it's uh, database options or data warehousing options or do a lot of machine learning and uh, serverless processing and all those sorts of things. So helping customers kind of build holistic solutions using using Azure. Uh, I'm a big fan of certifications. Uh, if you don't have many certifications, it's a fantastic way to kind of learn new things and, and, and build your resume. So I highly encourage you to get out there and get some of the um, certifications. And, and there's a new list out there that's been updated about a year ago with all the MC certifications. So they're, they're very cool to get to. Um, you got my contact information here on this slide. I'll give it to you again afterwards. Um, I blog at uh, Breaking BI. So you can, you, you can always check me out there. I have been blogging recently, unfortunately, because of kind of everything going on. But uh, I, I hope to get back to that at some point. And uh, as far as what I what else I do in my free time other than this is uh, I'm actually one of the organizers of the Charlotte BI group. And that's, that's one of the reasons that Kevin and I know each other. So if any of you ever in the Charlotte area, once all of this clears up, uh, we're happy to have you. We do presentations like this all the time uh, with, with various speakers from all over the world. So happy to have you either come as an attendee or, or hop in as a presenter if you'd like. So feel free to reach out. Uh, also, I know that a lot of people here probably already know about PASS, but if you don't know about PASS, Definitely go to pass.org. Um, pass Summit is uh, doing registrations now for this year. It's a fantastic event. I know that uh, SQL Saturday also happens multiple times uh, a year around the area. So those are awesome opportunities to kind of learn more and, and network with people. And uh, once once all of this passes, kind of give us a great opportunity to get back together and, and really start talking about the fun stuff and seeing some of the best speakers in the world. So. Uh, a lot of opportunities there, and you can reach out to me about that as well, um, or, or I'm sure I'm sure Kevin has information too. So, as far as what we're going to talk about tonight, um, very very short slideshow here. I don't want to spend any more than the next 60 seconds here, because we have exactly one slide. Okay, two slides. I lied. Um, one slide that says, "Here's what we're going to talk about." Um, so, what is PySpark? PySpark is simply a Python library for Spark processing. So Python, as, as I'm sure many of you have heard of, uh, is the new language of the day, really. It's uh, everything you're going to want to do in data can, can really be done in Python at, at this point. So it's becoming ubiquitous in pretty much all levels of, of data engineering, even up to the point where it's it's starting to rival SQL in its, in its pervasiveness. Um, and Spark is a big data processing framework. It's a really fast one, in fact. So the issue with Spark historically is that it was often written in languages like Java and Scala, which are just really hard for your average developer to write. So Python came along, and, and people build a Spark library for that, and it's so much easier to use that it really opens up the uh, Spark framework to people who aren't hardcore developers all day, every day. So what, what can Spark do? Um, Spark is built for streaming data processing. 
Uh, we're not going to see any of that tonight. Uh, it's built for batch data processing. This is what we're going to be doing for, for the first half. Um, it's built for graph data processing, which is really interesting. Um, and it does machine learning. It does all of that in the same set of packages. So you, you install PySpark, and you've got all of that at your fingertips. Um, and all of it works at scale. You can scale it up to clusters that have hundreds of nodes, and, and, and it automatically knows how to scale that. So be, be, before we get started with the demo, do we have any more questions? No questions so far. OK. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So uh, what you see here on my screen is actually a tool called um, Azure Databricks. It's a fantastic tool for kind of getting a, a Spark notebook environment in Azure. Highly encourage you to look into it. Um, so we're going to skip the first section here. That's just kind of my internal data prep. This section one is the data engineering section that we aren't going to go through in detail. But if you want to, you can take a look at it. It walks through the two different types of uh, data objects uh, that we commonly see in, in Spark. So the first is, is RDDs, and, and RDDs are a very low level object in, in Spark. It's, it's actually one of the foundational objects. And it's difficult to use, but extremely versatile. You can do virtually anything you ever want with it, including things like streaming media and sound files and images, and you can do whatever you want with it. But it's, it's tough. And, and, and you'll see that when, when you go through it. Data frames, on the other hand, are a lot like SQL tables. They have rows and columns, and you can do aggregations and operations on them. So that, that section kind of walks through those differences, and you can, you can see it there. So let's hop into the section that uh, people really said they wanted to see. Let's go through some, some data preparation. So in here, we're going to take a data set, and we're going to prepare it to do some predictive modeling on it. Um, and, and I've got all the commands here, and I've got a bunch of uh, comments along the way so that you can read along as you as you go. But the first thing we want to do is we want to take our data set and, and we want to look at it. So in Python, we have, or in PySpark, we have a describe function, uh, and we have a show function. So so the way PySpark works is um, uses dot notation. So you use here's here's an object, adult df. Sorry if that's kind of small. Let me let me zoom in. So we've got adult df, and then we can apply the dot describe function to that, and then we can apply the dot show function to the dot describe function. And, and, and what that says is, I want you to give me a summary of this data set, and I just want you to show it to me. Show becomes really important because of something called lazy processing, which you can you you can look up if you want to learn more about. But uh, unfortunately, PySpark is terrible at outputting tables, so it's really tough to read through. You have to really know what you're looking for. So I'm going to expand back out because that makes it a little bit easier to see. Understanding it's still going to be pretty small. There we go. So bear with me here. What we're looking at is each column in our table as well as some information about it. So we have, we have a number of columns here. For instance, one of these columns is, is uh, education. And what we can see, education has 32,561 records. Um, it, it has <clears throat> averages and, and standard deviations there, which don't apply to string columns. Um, and then it's got mins and maxes as well. And you, you can see all of that for every column here in the table. It gives you a nice, quick rundown. Uh, so kind of skipping ahead, I already looked through this, and a few things jumped out to me that we can we can look into. So first of all, we, we have a capital gain column. And the max value in that capital gain column is 99,999, which for a data um, analyst would immediately pop out as you, uh, is that a fake number? Because that's an awfully specific number to have as your max. Uh, so we'll answer that question. Another one we had is an hours per week of 99. Is that a real number? How much find out? And all of these text columns, mins and maxes, don't show you much about them. So what's in those, and how do we take a look at them? So we're going to hop through that real quick. So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to make a table of all the unique values and, and their counts. 
And it's not super hard to do with, with data frames because they have a lot of built-in functions for this. So I'm going to say, here's, a, here's my, my column name, it's capital gain, and I'm gonna assign that to a variable. And then I'm just gonna carry that variable down through my code. So I'm gonna say, I want you to take my adult data frame, I want you to group it by a column, and that column is gonna be capital gain. Then I want you to ca calculate the counts of that. And then I want you to sort that. And I want you to sort it by that column in descending order. So not the counts, but sort it by the actual column values. And then I want you to show it to me. You're going to see show. We have to show every single time we do anything. Um, and as you can see, I end up getting this table that shows us the capital gain of 99,999 is much, much higher than everything else below it. And there are a lot of values that take that place. Anybody have any ideas about what that might be? We'll see. People have. I have a guess, but I want to wait until somebody else guesses first. Sure. I'm sorry if the delay makes it a little bit more complicated. <laughs> That's okay. I'm, I'm also terrible at vamping, which means that <laughs> I'm, I'm not very good at uh, filling in the delay so that people have a chance to, an to answer questions. But it's it's okay. It's okay. Anyway, what's, what's your guess, Kevin? My guess is that 99999 is just a sentinel value that uh, is in the documentation as unknown. Yeah, that's my guess too. But with, with such an incredibly high number of those those values and the fact that they're very specific and very far away from the legitimate values tells me that, yeah, it's, it's probably a fake value. So let's remember that because we'll fix it later. So next, let's do the same exact thing, the same exact code. Uh, one of the advantages of using this uh, variable up at the top is I just get to copy and paste my code over and over again. There's a, there's a little tip for you. Um, so we're just gonna do the same thing with, with hours per week. Now we notice that hours per week is clean. It goes straight up from 98 to 99. So it looks like 99 is probably a legitimate value in this data set. Uh, but it is special, and the 99 also appears to be the max. So my guess is anything above 99 just got dropped down to 99, uh, which, which uh, that's still a whole other problem in and of itself, but it's not one we can fix here. We, we kind of have to go back to the data source and ask them why they're, why they're logging them as, uh, in, in that way. Now let's, let's do the same thing with education. So with education... Uh, we see here are all the different values we, we, we have. Remember, this was part of our question of uh, what's exactly in these text columns. So really, we're just, we're just taking a peek at this point, finding out what exactly is in our data. We see we got uh, 10th, 11th, 12th. We've got like elementary school and middle school. And I don't know if you've got junior high in your area. That, that, that's what that would be. Um, and we got various levels of, of college degrees and whatnot. And all of those look pretty reasonable. We can go down to income. Uh, this column is going to be very important later because this is what we're going to use to actually predict uh, for, for a predictive model. So we can see we have two values here, less than or equal to 50K and greater than 50K. We have marital status, and this list is going to go on and on for every single column. Going down to native country, you find something very interesting. We have a native country of question mark. We'll take a look at that later. Continuing to peek through, occupation has the same issue with question marks, interesting. The things we find when we roll through our data set, race looks fine, relationship status looks fine, sex looks fine, nothing major there. Work class also has the question mark, we see that. So basically, we're just scrolling through our data set, taking a peek, making sure all the values look good and whatnot. Um, exactly the kind of thing that we should all do before we type of, do any type of analysis. So as we were going through, we noticed a few different issues. Let's start fixing them. Let's, let's see how PySpark does that. So this being Python, we're going to use a lot of import functions. So basically, what I'm saying here is I want you to uh, look in the PySpark.sql.functions library and give me the win uh, library. 
win is actually a function. Um, it's it's not a library, but uh, you you can use that same syntax for for libraries as well. And I'll, I'm telling you here here's an array of all my column names, and I want you to iterate through these. And I want you to take my adult data frame, and I want you to overwrite it uh, with itself plus a new column. And this new column is going to be the original column name, which is C, so in this case, native country for, for the first run, underscore U. And in that column, I want you to do something. I want you to say when the column uh, value is equal to a question mark, I want you to replace it with an unknown. Otherwise, I just want you to use the original value itself. And, and after you do that, I want you to drop the original column. So our new data set should have native country underscore u and not native country. And, and we'll see that in a minute. So let's stop for just one second and talk about what, excuse me, what syntax looks like in Python, because it can get overwhelming if, if you don't know what you're looking at. So Python is white space sensitive, which is really awkward because most other languages aren't. So for instance, this tab here, is completely important. If I was to remove this tab, uh, it would it would it would break, because when you use a for loop, you have to put a tab after it. You have to use a, a white space. And you have to use a tab. PySpark also adds an additional convention onto that. So PySpark does not allow line breaks. However, I can modify that with these backslashes. So a backslash is an explicit line break. So I say I'm going to line break. And now the tabs don't matter. Welcome to Python. Uh, the tabs don't matter anymore because we are technically in the same line, just with an explicit line break. Um, so, so this allows me to use tabs to denote kind of the, the, the structure. So we can see that all of this is wrapped up inside a single statement. Inside this statement is this when clause, which is then being expanded upon by this otherwise function. Uh, so a bunch of... Uh, Python syntax there. Interestingly, notice we left out something we said we always need. We left out uh, show. So since we don't show, it doesn't show us anything. Instead, it gives us a representation of the object we just modified. Um, and that's actually really good in this case because we don't care what's in those columns, at least not yet. Uh, what we care about is the column name. So we can see down here at the bottom, that all of those three original columns are gone and they're replaced with the underscore U columns now. So, so we've done a little bit of data cleansing there. And now afterwards we can go back and we can do a dot show and we can look at the last three columns which are actually on every other line now. Um, and we can see if we see an unknown here, we don't see an unknown on the first page. Let's go down a little bit, maybe we'll find one. Here's one right here. We have an unknown now. So, so we see that our data prep has done its job. Now, just to verify, we can go down, remember this code again? I told you, re reusable code. We can run that same exact code again and notice that the question mark has gone and unknown is here. So we've already done some data cleansing on our data. Now, let's get even a little bit more complicated. So we looked at those text columns and we fixed a problem with them. Remember earlier though, we called out capital gain. Capital gain had some interesting values in it. Um, so particularly it had that 99,999 and we need to fix that. That's a problem. That's a big problem actually because there are no good solutions there. Um, most predictive modeling algorithms don't like nulls. They don't like empty values, which is really unfortunate um, because now we have to assign a value here. We could drop the record. If the capital gain column is that important, we could drop the record. Uh, we could also drop the, cap if the trap, if the capital gain column isn't important at all, we could drop the capital gain column. Um, but if we wanna keep the column and keep the record, our only option is to replace it with another legitimate value. Uh, and zero's a tough legitimate value to use because zero has its own meaning. Um, so a common method people use for this is means and medians. Uh, the mean is pretty easy to get. Uh, it's, it's, it's not too difficult. Uh, but median is a bit more interesting. The median is uh, mathematically called the, the, the 50th uh, percentile. 
Um, and percentiles are actually really hard to calculate in, in Spark um, for a number of distributed reasons we, we won't get into. However, there's an approximation function that makes it really easy. Uh, and that's called a prox quantile. And, and I run it here. And I say, I, I want you to give me the quantile of the capital gain column. Um, and I want you to give me the 50th percentile there. And then this 0.25 is kind of an accuracy measure because this is, this is an approximation. Um, but it does its job and it says our median is zero. So our data set is what we call very, very right skewed. It's, 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 it's zero heavy. So it seems to make a lot of sense that, hey, let's just assign these um, values of zero because zero is super common. So what we're doing here is just double checking that. When we, whenever we do a median, and the median also happens to equal the min, that leads us to another question of, did my median function work effectively? Did I make a mistake in it? Um, so what we're doing here is we're actually applying that same uh, logic, but we're doing a, a group by instead. We're saying, okay, just show me how many records equal zero and how many don't equal zero or more specifically, how many are greater than zero. So I use that same syntax that, that we looked at earlier in our, in our for loop, where I say I wanna add a new column, but this time it's an underscore greater than zero column. Um, and I want you to uh, say that when the column value itself is greater than zero, I want you to give it a, a string value of greater than zero. Otherwise, just give it a string value of zero. Um, and then after that, here's where, here's where PySpark starts to get interesting. Uh, you can chain these functions together as long as you want to. You can chain them over and over and over again. And in fact, that is a recommendation because Python will optimize on the back end. So the more you chain together, the more efficient it'll be. Uh, so we, we want to group by this, this new underscore zero, underscore greater than zero column we created and then do another count. And as we can see at the bottom, uh, the vast majority of our records, something like 90% of all of our records are zero and only a fraction of them are greater than zero. So our median being zero was completely completely legitimate. So it looks like replacing these 99,999s with zeros is a, is a good option. So now let's do that. Again, using the same exact uh, logic before. In fact, if I wanted to be even more clever, I could have probably uh, parameterized this entire function and just used the same exact code for this entire exercise. Uh, but we got the same logic here with the widths and the wins and the otherwises, except we change it to when it's greater than or when it's equal to 99999, uh, give it a zero. Otherwise, give it its original value back. And again, drop the original column. And as we can see at the start here, this is an overwrite operation. I'm replacing the data frame with itself. And now we can just double check that. We can check our capital gain underscore zero column now and see that the 99 at the top are gone. So voila, we, we fixed another problem. So I want to give a minute, minute for a breather. I know we talked about a lot there. Uh, absolutely, feel free to chime in with any questions you have along the way. I know this has been pretty basic so far, but it's, it's building. It's, it's, it's going to get more complex as we go. So now we have an issue. Uh, most modeling algorithms don't like strings. The, the, the majority of machine learning algorithms are uh, numerically oriented. They're basically just math. And math and text just don't like each other very much. So we have to find a way to turn that into uh, a number. And there's a really common way. It's called dummy variables or indicator variables or one-hot processing or any number of things you can do. Um, unfortunately, one-hot processing doesn't exist in PySpark uh, because PySpark is itself a library. It's not, uh, uh, it's not part of base Python. So we need to basically emulate it ourselves. So what we're going to do is we're going to take, in this example, the sex column. And we're going to say, instead of having one sex column that takes a value of female or male, I actually want you to create two new columns. Um, one is going to be a column for is this uh, person female? The other one's going to be, is this person male? Uh, interesting 
kind of side note there, you actually don't need both of those columns. Uh, since we know that in our case, we only have two values. If you are female, if you're female, then you're female. If you're not female, then you must be male, according to our logic. So you actually only need one of them, but uh, that's, that's more complex than, than we want to get into here. So let's go through some work here. And remember before we skipped the RDD section? Hmm. <laughs> so we skipped this section, so just bear with me. These are RDD functions, um, select and distinct and, and RDD and flat map and stuff. Um, you don't need to worry about what this does. Basically, all it does is it takes our sex column and it turns it into an array, very specifically an array. Um, and now that we have an array, uh, we can we can do some fun stuff with it. So what we're going to do is we're going to go down here, and we are going to use that same logic that that, uh, that we just we just did, and we're going to use it to make our columns. So uh, up here, remember we created a vowels variable here. And this vowels contains our array, our array of the unique values for, for that column. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look for our, our variable name as usual, but now we're going to do a function over an array. So instead of using a for loop here or something like that, um, we're actually going to kind of invert it. We're going to go inside an array because we want our result to be an array. Uh, like I said, bear with me. It's, it's, it's getting to become Spark processing at this point. Um, so we're actually going to create a function here. Really, really interesting. Since Spark doesn't execute anything um, when you tell it to, it only executes it when it needs to, you can do all sorts of fun things. Like in this case, we are literally going to create a function and store it in our array just to be used later. Um, so none of this is actually anything. It's all just uh, code in the back end. Nothing's being created or, or executed in this case. Um, and, and what we're going to store in this array is we're going to say when the value in column C equals the val, which we haven't defined yet, um, I'll, I'll, I want you to give it a 1. Otherwise, I want you to give it a 0. And then we want you to alias this new column as the original column name, in this case, sex underscore, and then the actual value it takes. So for instance, sex underscore female or sex underscore male. And now we define val. We say val is actually one of the values in that vals uh, array we just saw earlier, this array right here. Interesting. So now if we scroll down, we actually see what our result is. Very interesting. We have an array of what are called columns. This column doesn't exist. This column is literally just math waiting to be executed. Um, so now, now that we have that, we can we can do something really cool that I don't think has any analog in, in, in other languages I've seen. Uh, we can take our adult data frame and we can do a select, and we can say I want you to select all the original columns, adult data frame dot columns, plus all of the new columns I just defined right here. And then and then I want you to drop the original C column, and I want you to show me the top five records. And now you can see that the sex column is gone from our data set and replaced by sex underscore female and sex underscore male. And that entire thing was built straight off of the uh, uh, sex column and its values, and all of it was parameterized. So now I can just copy and paste that code, change the C value, and it's just going to keep running. So. Let's iterate through all of our columns and do all of that programmatically. So the first step is we need to get all of our string columns. Uh, so we are going to uh, first, we're going to create an array using the C0 value. So more, more Python here. Um, Python in most cases is a zero-based index language, meaning that you start counting at zero. Um, so C0 is actually the first record. And what is C? Um, it is the data type of adult.df uh, or uh, adult underscore df. So what this first element or zero with element actually represents is the data type of, uh, or it, no, it's the name of the column. Uh, but I only want you to do this if the second element or the, 
the one element, remember we start counting at zero, uh, is of value string, is, is, is of type string. So this is more, more Python programming, uh, more PySpark programming actually, um, to get us through uh, creating a, an array with all of the string values here. So remember, that's all programmatic. So this will work no matter what data set you apply it to. And, and that's something that if you're not following all of this, definitely something you can go back and do on your own. Um, Databricks is really cheap if you don't run it all the time. Um, so definitely something something you can you can try out on your own. So let's put all this together. Um, we're going to loop through our string values. And this is all the same code you've already seen. For this column value, we're going to use that code from earlier to create a list of the unique values for that column. Then we're going to create the new columns inside an array. Um, so for sex, this creates female male array. For sex, this creates the array of the sex underscore female and sex underscore male columns, which again, is not applied to anything yet, so it doesn't actually do anything. And then down here, I want you to overwrite the original array with the same array, selecting all of the original columns, plus the new columns we just created. And I want you to drop the one original string column that's defined by this iteration of the loop. And I want you to repeat that for every string value. So the exact process we just did, we're doing it over again. Except this time we're iterating through every string column. And now I can go down to the bottom and I can check all my columns. And now we've ballooned to a tremendous number of columns. Um, we actually have 108 columns now in our, in our data set. Uh, so you can look through all of this if you wanted to, but you see we've got marital status here, we've got race, we've got all sorts of things. Every column we had, we now have it broken out by uh, individual values, and all of this is zero and one. However, now we have another issue, one that's kind of interesting as well. Uh, we have these special characters here. And I know we want to get to the predictive modeling part, so I'm kind of going to skip over this a little bit. Um, you are welcome to come back through and, and check this on your own. But I do some more Python magic, and I do some replace statements to replace all of the special characters with nothing. Um, so now they're just, they're all gone. Uh, and that's what all this does, and scroll through. And now we get on to the data science modeling portion. So while you're scrolling through that, we do have a question. Uh, okay. from John Fan. Do I have to write Python in Spark or could I write SQL? That is a very good question. So Spark is simply a framework that understands a lot of things. Um, there is there is an extension called Spark SQL that allows you to use SQL on top of uh, uh, a, a Spark processing framework. It is not the SQL that you're used to though. It's not really select star from. What you, you've already seen PySpark here. If we look back, or you've already seen Spark SQL here. If we look back at, uh, where was it? This dot select and dot drop, that's Spark SQL. That, that's the select statement. Those are the where statements you've seen. Um, so it doesn't quite function like that. There are uh, certain tools that allow you to write more ANSI-like SQL directly on top of. Spark, for instance, Databricks has uh, has the option to do that um, using using uh, magic commands and things like that. But yes, if you know what you're doing. Uh, but generally speaking, um, Spark is built for your processing, and and you write it in a Spark native language like PySpark or Scala or Java. You typically don't do too much of your processing in something like SQL, because if you were going to do your processing in SQL, you might as well go use a SQL database to to, to do it the right way. Does that sound fair? Any any more context on that, Kevin? Uh, no, that's, that's a fair answer. Okay. Thank you. So this is where it gets hard. This is where it gets real hard. So if you've ever done machine learning in virtually any other language, forget that you've ever done it before. Because uh, Spark ML, um, what's what's called ML lib is, is is actually what it's what it's called. Um, it is very programmer oriented. It is not um, your data analysts machine learning. Uh, instead, you have to build vectors, 
And vectors are kind of difficult to explain, so I'm just going to show you what they are. Um, again, you'll have all of this code, so you don't need to memorize it. Uh, but what this is doing is this is building vectors out of my original data set. So we can see um, down here, what it does is it creates this, this row object. And it, it creates a row object with my output, or with my uh, uh, any, any column I specify. In this case, I'm specifically specifying income greater than 50,000 because that's what we're ultimately going to try to predict. This is a data set of people, and I ultimately want to predict based on all these other factors um, what, their, what their income is. And then it applies this sparse vector at the end. And this sparse vector tells you how many uh, di different values it has, uh, 108 different values. And then it tells you the index and then the value. So whatever column was index 0 had a value of 39. Whatever column was index 2 had a value of 13. Notice, notice that the numbers don't go in order. Um, these are vectors. And it, it does this for purely technical reasons. Um, so it's not like you're giving it a table anymore. These are vectors. They're not tables. And it does make things a little bit more complicated to work with. But it does make it easier in one way. Because now, instead of having a single column we want to use as our prediction, and then another column that, that we want to, or another set of columns we want to use for all of our features, we now have a single value for our features. And it is it, it, it's a single vector. So we can take that. And we can, we can use that for the rest of our predictive model building. So for, uh, for any of you that have some experience with, with machine learning, you might already know about splits. Um, for those that don't, whenever you're training a, a machine learning model, you never really want to test it using the same data you used to train it. That's like me, uh, me teaching you how to ride a bike, but me, you only ever riding the same bike you learned how to ride on. How would you be confident that you're actually good at riding a bike if you've only ever ridden the same one over and over again? So the best option is teach you how to ride using many, many bikes, and then give you a new bike you've never ridden on and see how well you ride. That's a great test for how well you learn how to actually ride a bike. Um, and that's basically what, what we're doing. We are taking a, a, a chunk of our data, in this case 30%, and we're setting it aside. We're saying, I'm not going to use you to build my model. Instead, I'm going to use you to test it at the end. And we can see how many records got set aside here. Um, 22,000 records for the training with, again, just two columns. Um, one, one column for our uh, what we call our dependent variable, and then another column for all of our independent variables wrapped up in a vector. We got about 10,000 records that we're holding off to the side, and we move on. So now, PySpark allows us to build uh, our models using some of the built-in libraries. So this first one we have is what's called a, a gradient-boosted tree. Um, this is a really common one. If you've ever heard of an R library called XGBoost, this is this is what they use. If if you look at uh, a, a lot of the different Kaggle competitions for um, building building the best predictive models for uh, like like yes no type of situations, um, gradient boosted trees are very very good. They're easy to write, they run quickly, and they're very accurate. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a tree here. We start with just building a classifier that's it's, it's what we call unfitted. Um, meaning that there's no actual data in it. It's just an empty math function. Um, and then we fit it using our data. And then we can take a look at that. You can see it's, it just tells you how many trees it has. It doesn't give you any information. Um, but we can use that to generate some predictions now. So we can take our gradient boosted tree and we can transform it against our test set, which is not the same as our training set. Remember, it's a different set of data. And then we can take a look at what happened. So here we see we have our original row and features right here. Uh, this is the same exact thing we just saw. But now it added some new stuff. It added a raw prediction, which is a dense vector, which is a really interesting concept I'm not going to get into. Um, but then it has something that's a bit more um, uh, un uh, understandable by, by, by the layperson of putting it in probability terms. So it says that this person has a 86% chance of being the first value and a 14% chance of being the second value. You have to know your data set to know what this means. Um, and it made a prediction of zero because remember, it's, these, are, these are one and zero values, not, uh, not, not one and two values. Uh, so zero in this case, if I remember correctly, is female because it goes in um, alphabetical order. 
And it did that for our entire data set. So the next step of the process for when we're doing predictive modeling is understanding how good our model is. And we can't do it by looking at this chart up here of all of these predictions. I only, I've, all I've got on the screen here is five and I'm already lost. And this data set has like, uh, what was it, 10,000 we were using for our testing set. So we certainly can't look through that um, ourselves. So we need to employ some um, different, different metrics for that. And there's, you could have a whole presentation on just the metrics themselves. Uh, but here we're going to use what's called the area under, under the rock curve, which is um, abbreviated AUC, uh, which is interesting because there's also another curve you can get the area under. So area under the curve, uh, that could actually mean two things, but it's commonly, it's commonly used to mean the rock. Um, and then the area under, under the precision recall curve. And we do those through this evaluator function. Uh, basically, you, you create this, this evaluator, and then you use your evaluator to evaluate. Makes sense, right? Um, and then you pass it in the metric that you want to evaluate your data set on. So I'm saying I want you to evaluate my predictions using the area under the rock um, or the area under the precision recall curve. And we won't get into the differences there. Um, basically, area under the curve is really good for um, what we call balanced data sets, where both options are about equally likely, um, where one option becomes much more likely than the other. Uh, precision recall becomes useful. So think of something like um, bank fraud. Uh, if you look at the million transactions that goes through a bank every day, a very small number of those are going to be fraudulent. So you, you would want something like precision recall for that, whereas rock would be something more like, in our case, um, our male and female was, was pretty evenly distributed, if you remember that from way back in the way back. Uh, so, so AUC is probably fine there. Um, and then it gives us these, these numbers. They're both bounded between 0 and 1, so they're nice and easy to understand. 90% uh, on your AUC is very good. 78% of your precision recall is pretty good too. So this model's it's, it's pretty good. Um, again, a different conversation about whether it's good enough. It's a whole different thing. But what we want to do now is let's try a few different models. The data science process doesn't stop when we build one model. So let's build a few more and let's put them all together. So next we're going to build a logistic regression and, and a naive base. And I chose these two because they are nice and easy and already built into, into PySpark. Uh, so we basically have the same exact code we had before, except we're changing the initial function here to logistic regression. And again, same exact code, but naive base. And now we just build another output showing all of them together. So now we see that we can compare our three models. Uh, the, the area under the rock curve. Uh, for the boosted decision tree, we got about 91%. For the logistic regression, we got a little worse at 90%. And at naive bays, we got 37%. Terrible. So let's look at precision recall. Boosted decision tree sitting at about 78%. Uh, Logistic regression is about 76%. And naive Bayes is 19%. So now we have a lot more evidence that says, hey, our boosted decision tree model is actually pretty good. We, we were up against two other types of models, and it worked pretty well. So that is the end of the material we had for that. I understand that was a lot of material really quickly. Like I said, you can always look through this again. Um, there's a ton here. In fact, we could spend the entire hour just looking at any one of these sections, kind of kind of digging into it. But at this point, I do want to give us an option to ask a bit more questions and have a bit more of an open conversation about what you thought of PySpark. Is it approachable? Is it something you're going to try to use? Um, understanding there is a learning curve here. But this opens up a world of processing that you will never be able to match in SQL, nor is the SQL database a good tool for doing machine learning and stuff like this anyway. So I'll pass it back to you. Sure, let's see what questions show up. So we haven't had any questions so far. It was an interesting walkthrough of the model. I guess my my question to you would be, do you have any thought as to why naive bays would be so catastrophically wrong here? <laughs> That's a really good question. And I'll be and I'll be frank with you. I don't even know what naive bays does. Oh, okay. <laughs> so this is one of those cases where I said, you know what? This is something I don't understand. I'm gonna try it. And it was so catastrophically wrong that 
to be fair to your point, if I was doing this in the real world, if I, if I was doing this for a job, I would investigate the crap out of that. No doubt. Why is this so much worse? What's going on here? Am I using this wrong? Um, yeah, but yeah, because Naive Bayes is the, I, I call it, um, sort of, I call it the enemy. And I'm, I mean that in the nicest way, where, you know, when my team builds out a model, if we're doing a classifier, Naive Bayes is the bench line that we have to beat. That if we can't beat Naive Bayes, that means that we're not doing a very good job. Um, it's still a, a fine algorithm in most cases. Obviously not this case. But, in a, <laughs> but it works in a lot of cases. Just interesting to see it completely flatline here, whereas logistic regression which is even simpler of a technique, does almost as well as a gradient boosting. Which is considered one of the best. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, which is interesting. You're, you're right. There's a lot of... This is, this is why uh, data scientists spend weeks or months tweaking their models. It's not just you build it once and you're done, because these are all the questions that you would need answers to before you'd ever you know, stake your business on something like this. Yeah, absolutely. So if there are any questions in chat, we would be glad to, I would be glad to relay them to Brad so that we can put him on the spot and ask really tough questions. Or if you want to ask really easy questions, those are also acceptable. While they're doing that, I'm going to pull up. I don't have an example. There is a way to, there is a way to write Spark SQL using more the ANSI SQL functionality to get back to that other person's questions. Yeah, I'll yeah. See if, if, uh, let's see if I can find an example of it real, real quick. Okay. Generally, um, you can use the percent SQL, the SQL magic, within a notebook. Oh, I could certainly do it here if I had the. Uh, um, in fact, let's. I don't. I don't like ad hocing most of the time, but I'll ad hoc this real quick. <laughs> um, so. You can actually do that here in um, here in D Databricks as well. So I can do something like select one, um, and that'll actually work here. Uh, I, I don't have I don't have a database set up behind this. Um, right. Uh, you can see this takes quite some time. Um, Spark is Spark has some overhead uh, because it's a distributed framework. It has a head node that then has to send work to a worker nodes and then get get results back and compile those. So yeah, there's there's stuff that goes on behind the scenes, um, which makes it not great for really tiny use cases like select one, but it makes it fantastic for use cases where you've got a billion records. Right, and also this is the first query that's running. Usually that first one after uh, your notebook gets the execution context, you don't have that wait. Let's see, I got a picture of somebody from Stack Overflow actually doing some Spark SQL using another way to do Spark SQL. Um, and you can see that that SQL worked there. Um, I'll actually drag this one over too. Right here in that picture, you see where it's in green and it says SQL context.sql? You can write SQL like that if you want to. Um, it actually all compiles down to the same thing I showed you, the, the dot SQL uh, or the dot select. But there's a number of different ways to do it. Um, and again, you can see all the stuff above this. Literally all of that was used to just select a letter from logs because this is a programming language after all. Um, yeah, and so, that particular example is Scala. Um, and if you change the single quotes to triple quotes, um, then you can have new lines in that text. Yeah, and that's actually a really interesting point that Kevin brought up. Um, this is Scala. And it, it looks so close to what we've seen the whole time, doesn't it? Because PySpark is specifically built to look and feel almost exactly like those other languages while being easier to use. So in a lot of cases, your code is almost just transferable. Um, so so like, like the SQL context.sql function is, is likely going to exist in, in PySpark as well in almost the same exact syntax. So that's, that's a cool a cool feature of, of PySpark and Scala and, and Java. Yeah. Yeah. Have you worked at all with uh, the spark.net? I have not. Okay. It is very similar as well, where about the only difference is that because uh, C-sharp methods tend to have capitalized first letters, they use um, 
Pascal casing instead of camel casing. So dot select will be a capital S instead of a lowercase s. But otherwise, it's almost line for line the same as PySpark and uh, Scala, when considering that it only works with um, data frames. Okay, so while we have a few extra minutes, if nobody has a question, part of the fun of this was, so the data science prep and the predictive modeling was stuff that I knew before putting this presentation together. The RDDs and data frames was actually what I learned while, while doing this, and it's really, really interesting. So I did want to kind of give you the payoff here at the end of this, uh, because the end of this section has a really, really interesting showcase of exactly what I mentioned earlier about everything we saw throughout this presentation was was data frames. And it all felt like tables for, for the most part. Um, you, you got to deal with columns, you got to do select, you got to make with columns, things like that. Um, things get a lot more complex when you're dealing with RDDs because RDDs don't have select and transform statements. They have map and reduce. You ever heard of map reduce? The, uh, the processing framework, This is this is it. And it's it's rough. So this, if I want to calculate a sum, I have to map my original column value, and I have to do a reduce of these random letters T plus H to make a sum. Um, so already it's it's pretty obtuse. Um, and, and as we scroll down, it gets even it gets, it gets even worse. Um, mm -hmm. If I want to calculate the average value um, grouped by some other values, I have to do a map followed by an aggregate by key, which is two different levels of lambda functions, which are themselves both obtuse, um, followed by another map function to bring it all together again, uh, versus data frames, which literally has group by average. And going even further, um, to do a join, this is how many lines of code it took to do a join. How many was that? That was 41 lines to do a join. And those numbers are super precise. If your columns change order, this breaks. Yep. Uh, versus this is data frames. <laughs> Column order, not important. So definitely if you are, if, if you have a use case where you've got a lot of data coming in and you want to start looking at Spark, this is a really cool exercise to go through of learning how to write MapReduce because it really, really lets you appreciate how easy SQL is and how equal how how easy data frames are. Yeah, the data frame API is incredible. It it made life so much easier. If you are interested in learning more about that, um, I'll pull it up real quick. As, as I said, um, I do blog. Um, again, I haven't blogged re too recently, but some, four of the more recent posts I have actually walk through kind of RDDs and data frames and a different type of data frame called a data set. Um, and it does all that in Scala too, not even by uh, Spark. Uh, you, you can find that at my blog, uh, Breaking BI. Um, you can go, you, you can look me up on GitHub. I'm Breaking BI. Um, and you can get all of the materials that were used in this presentation. Um, it's all out there for you to download. Um, it does require you to have Databricks to use it, but you can easily create a, uh, a trial Azure account, or you can create a pay-as-you-go Azure account. And spin up Databricks, it'll cost you two bucks or something to create Databricks and run this notebook. It's not. Not a lot. Um, but with that, I think that's all the material I had. Comment in chat. You have a convert. <laughs> <laughs> a convert for for what? A convert to PySpark? Convert to Databricks? Sounds like it. Sounds like PySpark. Uh, maybe maybe to Databricks in general. Oh, PySpark in particular. So I see I see John Fan in chat. Mentioning a bunch of uh, big data processing frameworks, I see you left out Pig. <laughs> Pig's a whole different can of worms. That was an interesting language. 
it is it is the whole whole presentation there but uh pig is pig is a fun one because you just kind of like tell pig what to do and then it goes and does it and it's really awkward and it's like i don't know how to describe it other than like you tell it what you want it to do and then it like does it super awkwardly and it's it, it takes like 10 minutes to learn too is, is what's so weird about it it's like, yeah yeah it's, <laughs> it's just an etl language like its entire yeah. job is data movement yep so a lot of options. Um, there are no limit to the number of options you can do this in. Uh, PySpark is super, super common, but you can absolutely do it in Hadoop using MapReduce. If you, if you really want to torture yourself with some programming, look up MapReduce. Um, uh, and then as, as John pointed out, well, we got plenty of others. So Flink, um, Storm is great for stream processing. Um, again, it's pretty developer oriented. You can, you can do streaming in, um, in Spark too, as we, as we saw. So that's a good one. And I've actually never heard of Samza before. That's a that's a new one for me. Yeah, it is a little a little less popular. Um, actually, if I was if I was gonna drop my top ones in there, uh, oh, this is back in 2016. All right, that makes sense. Oh, <laughs> yeah, the world's changed a lot. Yeah, Samza was developed in conjunction with Kafka. So basically, stateful applications that process reading from uh, various data sources. So basically, is early stream processor. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Last had a stable release nine months ago. Oh, okay. It was it was originally a LinkedIn. Um, actually, I think it was the same. It might have been the same team that did Kafka. Jay Kreps and company. But yeah, if you were gonna do stream processing today, um, I would look definitely at Kafka streams or Spark streaming or Flink. Uh, Apache Flink is also really nice. Okay, uh, any other questions or comments from anybody tonight? plug in the keyboards I guess I always have this fear that one of these one of these episodes I'm I'm gonna leave my mic off and not look at the little bar that's showing me that my mic's on and just spend 20 minutes talking and wonder why is nobody asking questions <laughs> Indeed. instead I have the mic on and I talk for 20 minutes and then I ask myself nobody asking questions <laughs> but I think uh, you did a good job of walking us through and so clear that nobody had any additional questions on it I'll take, I'll take that as a compliment and, and uh, like I said definitely hop over to my GitHub and, and pull this file down there's, there's a whole day worth of learning there to figure out how all that works and then we skipped over a lot of it so uh, yeah, actually, happy, to, happy like, to hear any questions you might have about it. Looks like there's one. Um, so Raymond's getting into streaming or streams for auditing purposes. Have you done any work like this for collections? So w w when you say, I want to make sure I understand, uh, three three words there: um, streams, auditing, and, and collections. When you say streams, are you talking about like streaming data? Um, when you say auditing, are you talking about like uh, looking through records to find unusual uh, occurrences? And by collections, are you talking about like bill collectors? Yes, on data, time series versus locations. I figured collections would be more of Oh, patterns on inventory tracking. Ooh, patterns so, over time. Those are really interesting questions. Um, I have not personally, um, no, but I know uh, there are a lot of people that are doing some really cool things. Um, some of the things I've been seeing more recently is tools are building in um, automated machine learning for finding suspicious records 
over time. So if you have a singular value, you're 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 tracking over time. Um, there are some some uh, kind of fraud detection algorithms out there to help you understand. Hey, this record just came in and it looks really odd. Um, but you're asking a really hard question around kind of like where date where things are over time. And there's a whole branch of kind of machine learning devoted to analyzing how things move and um, optimal routing and supply chain optimization and all that sort of stuff that is well beyond my my tiny feeble brain to uh, to dig into, unfortunately. User orders apart shipping versus delivery, uh, as in you have different steps along the way. I could see visualizing this. I haven't, I've not done much in terms of uh, machine learning on those aspects, but tracking flows and visualizing flows is a useful uh, exercise with streaming data. I think that's sufficiently vague for an answer. <laughs> Your mileage may vary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Ensuring that parts don't disappear due to theft or you're missing parts for shipping over time. Yeah, so I, I could see that where, um, yeah, that doesn't even necessarily have to be streaming data because you're, just, you're tracking event data, which it may be moving too slowly to be streaming. Like if you think about a part is on a truck, so parts on a truck, gets removed from the truck, put into a warehouse, put on another truck, move to another warehouse. You could have that be streaming data, but it seems like your window would be enormous. It's interesting. If you think about... Um... If you think about the way that like the tracking apps work for uh, like like FedEx or something like that, that's definitely streaming. It's not the, the individual package doesn't move quickly, but if you look at the number of packages that move at any given time, it is a lot of data. That's true. Um, so I mean, like it is it is interesting. Like if 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 you have FedEx ho hooked up your phone or something, you'll get a text message like forty five seconds after your package is delivered. Saying, hey, your package was delivered. Can you rate our service? Things like that. So you could you could certainly apply similar logic to, um, hey, your package was supposed to arrive but didn't. Uh, let's let's notify people. Or, or hey, your package is now going to the wrong place. Things like that. So a lot of interesting stuff that could be done there, and, and that would certainly be streaming if you wanted if you wanted to react quickly. The only question is, do you need to react quickly? Yeah. Does it, yeah. Does, does it help to react quickly? True. And um, when I say event-based, I'm still thinking you can certainly implement it in, in Apache Kafka, uh, and it could be near real time. So yeah, yeah, you have, that's a good point. But, all right, I think if we don't have any additional questions in here, that we are going to call it an evening. Final call. Okay, so with that, thank you very much for your presentation tonight, Brad. Uh, absolutely enjoyed it. Raymond says thank you. This was eye opening, which is a great thing to hear. Final well, thanks for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. Final closing announcement. One more call for Data Architecture Day. Check it out Saturday, May 16th. There is still one more day for our call for speakers if you're interested in submitting a session or if you just want to sign up to hang out here all day and catch some great sessions on architecture, data architecture, whether that be in the relational database with normalization data modeling, it could be warehousing, modern data warehousing, could be NoSQL data modeling. We've had some interesting submissions on a certain, each of those topics. So there will be a good mix of sessions over the course of Saturday, May 16th. And with that, everybody, 
Have a wonderful evening or a great morning for John Fan. And we are going to catch you later.